Greg Pruitt here with Idaho Dispatch, and I'm here today with Representative Brooke Green. Thank you for taking time to sit down with me. Sure thing. I'm actually glad to be here. So. <laughs> awesome. All right, so before we get started into maybe some of the policy questions, if you can let people know uh, which district do you represent, which party, and then kind of what area your district covers. No, certainly. So I am a Representative Green out of Southeast Boise. So that's District 18, and to put that into perspective, if you've been to Boise, it's um, like Harris Ranch Park Center, scoots a little bit over to Orchard. It's kind of this weird, bizarre um, district, and I've been in, I'm in my second term, so I've already finished my freshman year, and I'm heading into my second term and hoping to get a lot more accomplished. Okay, awesome. So if if you don't mind me asking, what, what was it like when you first got elected? And you, I mean, there's only 105 legislators, and there's a lot of people here in Idaho <laughs> compared to that. So what was that like when you first walked into the Capitol? And uh, holy cow. Yeah, humbling. I, I mean, you walk in and you've got these marble halls and it's, you know, this expectation, so much things and good things happen here. And to be able to walk into those halls and to know that you are expected to carry um, the weight and the desires and the needs of your constituents, and then know that you have so many more people to work with. Like you are one seat and there are several others that are there with their own interests, with their own uh, constituents, with their own needs, their own desires. And we're expected to figure out how to work together to make meaningful legislation. Like that is the most humbling thing is you're going to get in there and know you only occupy that seat. And then once you're gone, somebody else is going to occupy that seat as well. And so you've got to do good work while you're there and um, develop the relationships. And I will say it was my freshman year. Um, the first year was was enjoyable. The second year is everything you expected it to be. I passed some legislation that I worked on that um, was probably the epitome of sausage making, right? Like how a law comes to fruition. I experienced it all with just one bill. So. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So now, I mean, 2020 is is over. Uh, kind of feels like it maybe <laughs> continued a little bit into 2021. Uh, what are you hoping both as a body that you guys are able to accomplish this year? And then is there anything that you want to talk about that you're personally working on on behalf of your constituents or that you think Idaho needs? Right. So as a body, and I'm, I know, I mean, the hot topics, right, is like this, this balance of power, right? What does that look like as it pertains to COVID and the emergency declaration and, and you know, how all of that came about? I know that is certainly an issue. Um, I, in my district, and actually in particular Boise, um, there's a lot of people who are actually in support of it. And so that kind of brings back to that perspective, like how we are sent down here to these marble halls to represent our constituents. And the lens we see things through is really about our districts. So what's important in Boise may not be the same as importance up in like Northern Idaho or in Southern Idaho or in other districts. And so um, I would certainly say the emergency declaration, the balance of power. Now I might be on the other side where it is I'm trying to ensure that we keep the dollars available to our state to respond to the crisis at hand. Whereas other, you know, other legislators, they want to see a lot of that uh, dissolved or changed. And so that I know is important. Um, is it as important as it is up in say Northern Idaho or in some other areas of the state? May not necessarily be the same for my district. Uh, other things that we've talked about, but we never actually accomplish. And one thing I'd like to support my colleagues and there's my colleagues are running legislation for this is property tax. I mean, the reality is um, our property taxes are increasing and we're pricing ourselves out of homes. And I'm actually one of those who just recently sold my house in October and looking to buy this summer. And oh my goodness, like the exorbitant costs associated with purchasing a home did I price myself out? Like that is a fear many of us have to look into and the costs associated with the taxes, like that thing, they just keep increasing, increasing, and we have done nothing to address it. Um, so talking to specifically property tax and what I'd like to see occur and I'm going to support my colleagues in is looking at the homeowner's exemption, looking at the circuit breaker. I mean, our homeowner's exemption is a hundred thousand dollars. Like we really need to reevaluate that. And we did this to ourselves. The state legislature took the balance of what used to be residential and commercial and we shifted it and we put more burden on actually our residential property owners than we did for commercial. So we need to seek an opportunity for a balance. And so those are probably some really important things that I I'm certain my constituents are very much interested in. Other things, um, personally, what I'm hoping to accomplish, um, 
There are a couple legislative uh, legislative bills I am bringing forward. Um, one of them actually has to do with our veterans, and it came from a constituent in my district. A couple years ago, we passed legislation that enabled um, a veteran who has a disability to have a property tax reduction, and which is passed a. Uh, should have passed again unanimously, but it didn't. One, there's one dissenting vote on the House side, but um, there seemed to be a loophole with this. And what has occurred with that legislation, mind you, it's just a recent legislation, so it's a cleanup bill, is that benefit stays with the House, does not go with the veteran. So should the veteran move mid-year to a new home, that benefit's not following them. It's actually going to stay at the previous House, resulting in a non-veteran, somebody who did not deserve you know that benefit getting a veteran's benefit and Interesting. which is uh right it didn't i yeah. it was brought to my attention and i was appalled because i will um briefly my really good friend um about five years six years ago several more than that at this point um stepped on an ied in afghanistan lost both his legs and he it, and i know he doesn't want to earn that benefit but he gave um almost his life to his country and absolutely under no circumstances should somebody come into his home afterwards and get his benefit. Um, they only get it for one year, but that's one year less that that veteran's not getting it. And yeah. so this bill cleans it up. I hope I'm um, meeting with the chairman today in hopes that I could get this heard in his committee. Okay. Um, it, it's, I think it's our obligation to ensure our veterans um, have these benefits and that non-veterans don't reap the benefits of somebody else's service. So. That's one okay. <laughs> bill. Um, I can rattle off a couple others, but primarily what I'm anticipating doing this year is really supporting um, our property tax issues, really trying to get behind my colleagues who are running those bills, and really trying to uh, evaluate opportunities. You know, is there an opportunity for compromise? Can I reach across the aisle and figure out, figure out what that looks like? Um, yeah. And I mean, that's the direction I intend to go. It's always been my notion coming here. I have no particular platform that I have adopted. Um, somebody asked me that last night, and it really is about the issues you know, that are current in that year because we represent constituents and issues are fluid. Every year after year, they oftentimes change. And so I recognize that as uh, my responsibility. Yeah. So what is that like? I mean, you kind of touched on that a little bit, working across the aisle. You know, the, the Democrats are in the minority party, obviously, in Idaho, and, and obviously, you know, Republicans have a super majority. And so is, is that the challenge for you is you know, to reach across the aisle and try to find issues like property taxes that you can work on versus issues that, you know, maybe don't have a chance, maybe that you like, but may not have a chance given the makeup of the legislature currently. Right. So, I mean, there are, there's obviously issues that I think we're going to be on polar opposites. Um, and I was on state affairs for two years, so I experienced that. <laughs> I, I think I had a colleague, a uh, Republican colleague tell me, um, you, we beat you up every single day and every day you come back and you're smiling. And that's partly true, but boy, the soul has been just like sucked out of me. Um, there's so much truth. We are the super minority, and and that's the reality of our state. And I recognize and respect that. And um, does that make it that much more challenging to get legislation passed? It certainly does. It also means that the time that I spend on legislation, I'm really going to vet it. Um, I'm really going to seek compromise and opportunities to work with my colleagues across the aisle, um, only because. You know, it's not my choice if my legislation gets heard. It's it is the majority party's choice if my legislation gets heard, and that in itself is humbling because I have an expectation to come and work on behalf of my constituents, and I can't always do that. And so it just means our time is spent um, very methodical. You know, I'm approaching issues, um, legislation, and being very particular in which ones I carry sure. um, for that very reason. There's. We dig our hills in for a reason. State Affairs is a really good example of everybody digging their hills in for really important social issues. Um, I spent my time there. I am thrilled to be on JFAC now because behind every issue, behind every uh, department, behind every policy, there's a, a dollar sign. And so I think I could be more meaningful in JFAC and work on behalf of constituents and addressing like how we do our budgeting and such. Sure. But it's... It is, you know, it's humbling to walk through those doors. It's more humbling to be in the super minority. But um, I do, I will say some of my closest friends are Republicans. Um, I developed a really great relationship with a Republican colleague of mine. And, you know, I wouldn't change that. Um, I And there's a lot to be said. I will say one quick cool story is last year I was the only Democrat 
housed in my office space with all Republicans. <laughs> and it was the best thing to have ever happened because we spent more time in each other's office talking about issues that are important to us and understanding each other's position um, that you don't get when you are housed with your own caucus. Yeah. And so uh, to me, that was probably the best experience was to surround myself with differing opinions and I get to know my colleagues a little bit better. So. Sure. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, in closing, is there anything else you'd like to add as far as uh, a message to either your constituents and or to the people of Idaho in general? You know, the message I would like to um, just to provide is like we are in so many uncertain circumstances. Like the circumstances in front of us right now, um, there's so much uncertainty out there. Um, and I know it's not tough and I know the decisions we're going to make are not going to be appreciated by all. And that's the catch is, is we're here to do our jobs and we're not necessarily all here to agree with one another, but we're here to seek on compromise and opportunities for discussion. And I think that's probably the best thing. You see what's going on at the national capital and you see the divisiveness and we feel it here. By all means, we have felt it here. Um, it's not who we are. I think we all come in here with good intentions. The lens we see our our world through is expected to be different and we need to be respectful of one another and, and provide that professional uh, respect. Yeah. But I will tell you, like, there is some good legislation coming down the pipeline. We are going to find it. And then there's some, some legislation that I'm going to vote no. And it's, and it's not because um, the person carrying it I have issue with. It's probably just because the constituents I serve may not see it the same as the con constituents that individual or that legislator serves. And so, yeah. um, but we're all here to good, we all have good intentions. And I just want to leave that with you guys that um, we're going to be, have different opinion on how we get there, but there are some stuff we're going to find common ground on. I will tell you, I'm 100% with my veterans. I'm married to a law enforcement officer. Um, you know, I, and I know those are issues important to, to your folks within your agency, but I'm also a big proponent of funding for public schools and our education system. I'm also a huge proponent for behavioral health. Uh, losing my best friend to suicide is eye-opening experience and we don't do enough to provide services. And so, you know, there's so much to how we operate and we're going to collectively find a way in which we can do it together. So yeah. I'll leave you with that. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate you sitting down with us today. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation and good luck with all your other interviews. Yeah. <laughs>